Blessed morning and welcome in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is quasi-modo geniti. Those are Latin words that come from the antiphon to our intro, intro it today, which means like newborn infants or in the manner of newborn babes. We crave the pure spiritual milk of the Word of God. It's also known as Doubting Thomas Sunday because the historical gospel appointed for this day is the account of Doubting Thomas who needed to see and touch in order for him to believe. So I'll have some words about that in our homily today. Uh, we are blessed today to have uh, Jean Hilbert with us playing the piano for our hymns and liturgy, and Lynn Niehaus is uh, in the congregation, a congregation of one uh, who's going to assist me in singing the liturgy and the hymns. Um, we will be following uh, Divine Service Setting 3, which is page 184 in the Lutheran Service Book Hymnal. If you have this at home, you'll find it on page 184. Um, you will also, no you won't, that, that's the only place you're going to find it. So uh, I hope you have that. And I'll, I'll be calling out um, hymns, numbers, and page numbers as we go through the service so that uh, you can flip to those pages and find them. Our first hymn, our opening hymn, is Awake My Heart with Gladness. It's a wonderful hymn by Paul Gerhardt. We will be singing verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 7. So that's hymn 467, verses 1 and 2, 6 and 7. Turn to page 184, Divine Service, setting three. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in our Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sin unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, 
who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce God's grace unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the intro, it printed on your um, proper's insert. Like newborn infants, alleluia, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, alleluia. Sing aloud to God our strength, shout for joy to the God of You called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of And for the hymn of praise, we will sing, This is the Feast, during the Easter season. Page 171, This is the Feast. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and con conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for Quasimodo Geneti, the second Sunday of Easter, is from Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord your God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place, in your own, place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from 1 John, the fifth chapter. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has this testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He has risen from the dead 
and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. Eight days later, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Alleluia. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee. Please join me in making confession of our Christian faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 192. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of the day is page 472, These Things Did Thomas Count as Real, hymn 472. Yeah. 
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who were the people of great faith in the Bible? Truly, there were very few that were designated as such. There was Abram, who believed the Lord, and the Lord credited that belief to him as righteousness. And there was Jacob, who wrestled with the Lord, and would not let go without the Lord's blessing, even though the Lord wounded him, and he went away permanently injured and limping. There was Mary, the mother of our Lord, who at the angelic announcement that she would conceive and bear the Son of God, faithfully replied, Lord, may it be to me according to your word. And there was that Canaanite woman whom Jesus at first ignored, and then rejected, and then insulted, who still refused to let go and give up, so that finally Jesus proclaimed of her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And there are a few others, but precious few people of great faith. Indeed, most of the people of faith in the Bible are not people of great faith, but they are people of little faith or weak faith even struggling with faith. And I say to you, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for you. For are not you such a person of such faith? Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Those were the words of a father who brought his demon-possessed son before Jesus to be healed. However, the man was lukewarm in his faith. He said to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Well, Jesus mildly rebuked the man, saying, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Now, of course, this is true. Your Lord Jesus says so. But I ask you, does that really make you feel any better? It doesn't make me feel any better, at least not if I understand those words of Jesus in the way they are commonly misunderstood and misapplied today. You see, these words of Jesus are commonly misunderstood to mean that you simply have to believe more or believe better. Then the miracles will really begin to happen for you. You ever heard that kind of talk? This is the misunderstanding that drives some of the popular televangelists you see on TV. People like Ken Hagen and Ken Copeland and Benny Hinn and Paul Crouch, Oral Roberts, T.D. Jakes, even Joel Olstein. They preach and they teach a name it and claim it doctrine in which the onus is really on you to really, really believe and to make the miracle happen. And so faith becomes a force, like in Star Wars, use the force, Luke, whereby you can get what you want, rather than abiding trust in God, even during times of trial and suffering. On the other hand, if you think positive thoughts, or if you just have enough faith, they teach, well then you can have health and wealth and happiness now, when you want it, on your terms. This is a poisonous doctrine, and it's poisonous in at least two different ways. First, it makes faith a work that you do instead of a gift of God the Holy Spirit that has worked in you. And second, and even worse, it places man above God. 
in that man manipulates and controls God by man's work of faith. So let's watch out for that kind of interpretation of those words. All things are possible if you only believe. So what does Jesus mean when he says all things are possible for one who believes? Well, it's really pretty self-explanatory when you jettison that nonsensical and unbiblical misunderstanding that faith and belief are a work that you perform. They most certainly are not. But belief is something that you, that you come to, that you are led to, based upon evidence and your, your experiences in your life. That is why some things that you used to believe as a child, you no longer believe as an adult, hopefully. And likewise, you may come to believe new things and other things throughout your life that you didn't believe before. However, Christian belief, which is commonly called faith, it has its origin in the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Jesus himself teaches that no one can come to me unless the Father calls him. And so Luther taught us to confess in the small catechism that I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, has enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. This is most certainly true. Thus, all things are possible for one who believes, not because belief is a work that you do, but rather because of the object of your belief, Jesus Christ. All things are possible for the one who believes in Jesus, for whom all things are possible. It is not your believing that makes all things possible, but it is what you believe in that makes all things possible. That is why the Lord credited Abraham with righteousness. Abraham wasn't righteous in himself, but he believed and he trusted in the word and the promise of the Lord, which is righteous. Thus, Abraham received an imputed righteousness. An alien righteousness, a righteousness that came from outside of him, that was created within him by the work of the Holy Spirit, which itself came from outside of him through the word of God. So also Jacob had great faith in the Lord who wrestled with him, who even seemed to be against him as his enemy. Now I know someone's going to want to say, see, Jacob had to hold on, right? That's what, that's what caused the blessing to come. He held on. He didn't let go. It was a work. No, you're wrong about that. It was the Lord's promise and his word to which Jacob clung and held on to and would not let go. And that word and promise was given first to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob. It was given before Jacob was even born. It was the source and the origin and the substance of Jacob's faith. It was entirely the work and the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. Likewise, Mary believed and received and conceived the Spirit-bestowing Word of God. And the Canaanite woman, like Jacob, refused to let go, even when he seemed to be against her. But then there's Thomas. Yes, doubting Thomas, as he has come to be known. I don't know about you, I like Thomas. Thomas is a saint that I can believe in. In fact, I am Thomas, I'll admit that. And Thomas is me. And I wonder, is Thomas you as well? If you're honest with yourself, I suspect that he is. When the other disciples told Thomas that they had seen the Lord, Thomas infamously exclaimed, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, place my finger into the mark of the nails, place my hand in his side, I will never believe. You see, I don't think that Thomas' faith was all that weak, or even lukewarm. Rather, I think that Thomas knew his faith, and he knew the limitations of his faith. He didn't have faith in his faith. But Thomas had faith in Jesus, and only in Jesus. 
He knew that it would require Jesus and only Jesus for him to truly believe. He needed to hear. He needed to see. He needed to touch his Jesus. He was only being honest. Truly, Thomas' faith was very much like the faith of that father I mentioned earlier, the one who had a demon-possessed son. The man pleaded with Jesus, saying, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Help me with my unbelief. You see, Thomas had faith, but he didn't have faith in his faith, and you shouldn't either. Faith doesn't save that way. Faith in Christ saves. But again, it's not faith that saves you. Only Christ does that. But you receive Christ's salvation through faith. Faith that is created and given as a gift by the Holy Spirit. It is a channel, a means of grace. Holy apart from your works. Holy apart from your worth. Holy apart from your merit or anything that you are or do. You see, Thomas knew what he needed. I know what I need. Do you know what you need? You need Jesus. You need his word, which you receive by hearing. You receive by hearing the Holy Spirit, who creates that faith in you, which clings to and trusts in that word, which clings to and trusts in Jesus. That's what you need. But you also need Jesus' wounds. That is, like Thomas, you need to see, you need to touch, you need to taste Jesus' glorified and holy wounds, that your faith may be strengthened and preserved through, through the good times and through the bad times, through death unto resurrection to eternal life. Yes, it is true what Jesus said to Thomas. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And yet still, Jesus lovingly and mercifully and graciously invited Thomas to come and to touch and to handle his wounds. Jesus still lovingly and mercifully and graciously invites you to come and touch and handle his wounds. And maybe Thomas did. Probably Thomas did. But not before he confessed, my Lord and my God. A confession that was even greater than the one that St. Peter had so famously made. In tribute to this, do you know what I say silently to myself each and every time before this altar when I kneel to receive the body and the blood of Jesus, myself, and the Holy Eucharist, I say what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Because I am Thomas. Thomas is me. Is Thomas you? I pray that he is. Weak faith? Maybe. Struggling faith? Oh, most definitely. Faith that receives Jesus and all his benefits, that clings to him only? Oh yes, most certainly yes. These are all faith. These are all faith that receives Jesus and clings to him and him alone. Faith that benefits from all of his blessings, the forgiveness of sins, salvation, eternal life, Sonship with the Father, a reign with Jesus in his kingdom that has no end. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus invites you, saying, Come here, put out your hand, touch my wounds, handle them, eat my resurrected and glorified body, drink my holy blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus reaches out to you and he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you brought us up out of the Egypt of hell into the Zion of Christ's Church through the Red Sea of the baptismal font. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that as we continue to wend our way through the wilderness of this sinful world, we would long for the pure spiritual milk of your word and receive the sustenance we need until we are brought to the promised land of life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your Son appeared to his disciples in his resurrected flesh to ordain them and send them out into the world that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. Continue to raise up for us faithful men to serve in the office of the Holy Ministry and sustain those whom you have sent with the courage and endurance of their Lord. Bless their service among your people who with St. Thomas confess Jesus as their Lord and their God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, remember those who have wandered from the household of faith. Faithful to your promises, work all things in their lives to remind them of their need for your unending grace and steadfast love, that they might return to the faith and rejoice in your Son, who has died and is risen for them. As you sustain the exiles in Babylon, so sustain your scattered church, until all may gather together again at your table. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace. Bless those whom you have placed in authority over us at the federal, state, and local levels. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor and to work for the benefit of all. Protect them, give them health, and direct them wisely in their response to the ongoing pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, look in mercy upon all who suffer in this veil of tears. We pray for those who are isolated, for the ill or endangered, for those suffering from the coronavirus, for those who mourn. Hear our prayers especially this day for Harry Price, who is Carol Heckman's brother and is hospitalized, for Connie Heine, who is Judy Gamble and Larry Keeker's cousin and a best friend of Ray Jean Keeker, who is also hospitalized. We pray for Don Bliss and for Steve Heineman, who have been released from the hospital. We pray for those struggling with health issues of various kinds, Marlis Holmeister, Verdine Miller, Penny Murray, Norm Holmeyer, Kenny Fisher, and Katie Foster. We pray for those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, businesses that are closed and farmers whose um, produ produce is uh, in uh, too great a supply to meet uh, an underwhelming demand. We pray for the residents of nursing homes and um, assisted living centers, especially Bartles in our own community where many of our members reside. We also uh, give thanks for those who have recovered from this virus, um, Pastor Val Swinton, from Clarksville, and Lisa Josh and Barney, um, Barney and Jean Hilbert's sister-in-law. We pray for those who mourn the death of loved ones, um, for the family and the friends of David Steen, who is Beth Heckman's father, called to rest this week. Dear God, Heavenly Father, bring healing to those who are ill uh, in accordance with your good and gracious will. Comfort those who mourn with the sure and certain hope and promise of the resurrection of, of the dead on the last day, sealed in Jesus' own resurrection, which we have celebrated and continue to celebrate together. And we pray for um, these businesses that um, they will have what they need to survive uh, through this time and that they will be restored in due time to fullness and prosperity. We commend all of them into your merciful care. Provide these with loving and compassionate care and comfort everyone with the reminder 
that those who have been born of God overcome the world, believing that Jesus is the Christ, they have life in his name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, as your risen Son visited his disciples on the eighth day of the resurrection, so he visits us in word and sacrament whenever Christians are gathered together in his name. Bless those who come to receive him at the holy altar this day, wherever it is offered. Open their mouths that they would be filled with the sweet honey of Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of their sins. And comfort and sustain those who are unable to gather together this Lord's Day for your holy sacrament. Preserve us in the faith that together with all the saints who have gone before us, we may be raised to life forever in Christ's kingdom, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray together as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. closing hymn is hymn 480, He's Risen, He's Risen. This is a hymn, both the text and the tune are written by C.F.W. Walther, who was the first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Um, 480, He's Risen, He's Risen. <laughs>
God's blessings to you in Christ our Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We go forth in peace. In the name of the Lord. Amen.